All right, everyone. Welcome to our fourth lecture. Uh, this will be our second lecture on the internet. Um, so today we're actually going to be taking a look at kind of the internet from a higher level and the internet from a lower level. So last week, remember, uh, we went over some networking foundations to kind of get a sense of how the internet is built. So today we're going to build on top of those foundations and then actually dig a la a, another layer even lower than those foundations. Um, so this should actually be a pretty fun lecture. So just a reminder uh, that next week is our first exam. Uh, it'll be held right here, so same time and place. Uh, you'll have the full two hours for the exam, so 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, and the exam will cover all of these past four weeks about equally. Um, so everything from binary and turning on a computer up to all the stuff we're going to see today with HTTP and protocols and other things like that. Um, the questions on the exam will be pretty similar to those in the problem sets. So you'll have a mix of short answer as well as some multiple choice and some fill in the blank. Um, but there won't be anything crazy, no curveballs or anything like that. Um, so if you're looking to what to study, I would definitely flip through all of the recaps, because kind of everything on the recaps are things that we could cover on the exam, as well as the end of every one of these lectures. I try to have some summary slides uh, with just some terms that, some key terms that you might want to know um, from each lecture. So we'll also have a review session today, uh, right after lecture, that'll be recorded and led by Ben and RJ. Um, so this will be an opportunity to ask questions about the exam or about any topics that you're having trouble with. Um, we'll make that available as soon as we can. Uh, if you're a distance student, uh, you can check out the Extension School's website for information about proctored exams. Uh, we're giving you as much time as we possibly can, which is about 36 hours or so, to complete the exam um, so that hopefully that we can be as accommodating as possible. Um, so any exam questions, um, definitely feel free to ask them uh, at the review session, which I'll be here as well, uh, that Ben and RJ will lead uh, right after lecture. Um, so on last week's problem set, uh, we asked you to complete a feedback form. And the responses were great. They were really, really helpful. Uh, and we're definitely looking to improve the course as we go along. So if you didn't complete this feedback form, I would really ask that you do. Even if you didn't do the problem set, maybe you're just kind of auditing the course or something like that. Even if you didn't do the problem set, I'd really love it uh, if you can complete the feedback form to give us some ideas on how to, complete, uh, how to improve the class. Uh, so one common suggestion on the feedback forms, complete this feedback form, I would really ask that you do. Whoa. Even if you didn't ah, do the problem that. set. It's me, five seconds ago. <laughs> so one uh, really common uh, request on the feedback form uh, was to post stuff before lecture instead of after lecture. And so now, actually, if you head to the lectures page, uh, you can find the slideshow that we're showing right now. Uh, if you want to follow along the slides and the recaps page, uh, we also have the three recaps uh, that are associated with this week's lecture. So if you want to follow along, uh, you can do that. So hopefully that makes things a little bit easier. Uh, by the way, this week's, of all the puns and all the recap titles, this one is actually my favorite. I am most proud of Protocol Me, maybe, and we'll see why soon. Uh, just one small thing. Uh, I might edit these recaps after the lecture, um, just to you know, make things a little bit clearer, or maybe add some additional pictures or diagrams or references. So if they're a little bit different uh, now and maybe tomorrow, that's why. Uh, just, I reserve the right to make them better after lecture. So last week, uh, and on the problem set, we talked about this idea of net neutrality. And in case you kind of forgot what that was, if you did the problem set early, uh, which everyone always does, of course. The basic idea behind net neutrality is that we would allow something like this. So this idea of tiered internet access and giving your ISP control over how much or what parts of the internet you can access. So the problems that we asked you, you know, what are your thoughts on this? And I actually thought we could begin kind of with a discussion of you know, what, what do people think about net neutrality? Because this is actually a topic that's really, really interesting to me and it's still really, really uh, current. So what are, what are anyone's thoughts on something like this? Is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? Why might we want or not want something like this? Yeah. Don't like it. Okay, you don't like it. Why not? Yeah, and so that's, that's actually a really common uh, argument against net neutrality, right? What if I'm one of these small sites and my logo isn't featured on this advertisement here? So someone wants their news and they're paying $5 a month to get New York Times and on this other small news site, you know, people might not even have access to me because I'm not paying this ISP enough money or people might not know about me because you know, they're, they're, they see all these logos that are kind of being endorsed by the ISP now. So that's one argument against. Anyone else have any thoughts for or against? Yeah. Say that there's big and small sites, 
to what point are they going to be a good site? To what point are they going to you know, be determined as an independent site, so-called? Yeah, no, that's a great point. It, it definitely calls into question, you know, what, what does it mean to be on here? And like, how, how big is too big? And you know, what, what happens when, what happens to both, you know, this ecosystem of websites when we start doing something like this? So yeah, that's another great point. Yeah. Yeah, so that's another great point. So you know, this, this kind of thing is called a bandwidth cap. And so basically your, your ISP says, well, you get so many gigabytes of data per month. And your, your cell phone plan also might have something like this. So now, as you mentioned, yeah, if you let your kids in the internet all day and suddenly they start running up uh, all of those gigabytes that you're paying for every month, you know, that's a problem. Another, another interesting thing with the Netflix example, Netflix already has the monthly subscription, right? So now to access Netflix, you're not only paying Comcast or you know, whoever, whatever ISP some number of dollars a month, now you're paying Netflix some other, dollars, some other amount of dollars a month. Uh, which may or may not be a good thing. Anyone else have any thoughts? I think it's going to extend that into a backfire on, on after a while because one of the ISPs is going to say we're going to go ahead and get all everything, all or complete access and just drive the price down and collect all the customers. Yeah, and so this might yeah, so this might totally backfire completely from a, from an economic perspective from both the sites or from the ISP definitely. Yeah, so hopefully these are kind of the the kinds of questions that you can start asking yourself. Uh, as we see some more tech updates in the news. Um, but I really, really like net neutrality. I think it's a super interesting topic. Um, so it seems everyone here is kind of against it. Um, but that's definitely not the norm. There are definitely people who want, who want something like this. You know, what, what if I end up paying you know, $10 a month for the internet? And I'm totally satisfied with that. You know, if, I, if I only use my home internet to check my email and I use my work internet for everything else, you know, maybe I might want to pay $10 a month for that. But then as we saw, there's, there's many other arguments against that. So it's very much an open question. And it's one that is particularly uh, really interesting to me. So we mentioned last time uh, that one of the goals of the internet really is to be able to connect as many different devices as possible. So one of the problems here is that we have a bunch of different types of devices on the internet, right? I have my iPhone, I have my iPad, I have my MacBook, someone else might have a Windows something, um, but we need somehow some way for these two things to communicate, right? The Windows is running a completely different operating system on completely different software and completely different hardware, and somehow that needs to be able to send messages to my iPhone, which is running, again, completely different everything. And so the way we're going to solve this problem is with these things called protocols. And a protocol is kind of a big word, fancy, kind of scary sounding, but all it is is kind of a formal set of rules for communicating. And so we actually use protocols maybe unknowingly in our everyday life. So let's say I, I just met Ben. So Ben's sitting here, and, and I just met Ben. So kind of instinctually, you know, what, what social norms tell me to do is I'd say, hi, I'm Tommy. Hi, hi, I'm Ben. <laughs> and so we just, we just followed a protocol there, right? I have never met Ben before, and Ben's a little socially awkward, but he did OK. So when I was going to meet Ben, I, I reached out my hand. And this is something that, you know, if, if you didn't know what this was, you'd be, why is Tommy's hand up? I don't know. But this is kind of a protocol that we've established. We have this rules for interacting. So when I stick out my hand, if Ben follows the I just met you and I'm only kind of awkward protocol, he's going to reach out his hand and shake mine. And so now we've just interacted. Me and Ben are running completely different hardware, right? We're two different people. I don't know if the analogy works there, but we're two completely different people, but we're following the same set of rules. You're good. <laughs> But we're following the same set of rules, and so we were able to interact, even though we've never communicated, well, we have, but if we had never communicated ever before, we'd be able to communicate with each other because we're following this same protocol. So we've actually already seen an example of a protocol, and that is DHCP. So does anyone remember from last week what DHCP is? Yeah, exactly. So DHCP is the process through which you can get assigned an IP on the internet. And so we said that DHCP stands for something, something, something protocol. And as we'll see today, we're going to look at a whole lot of acronyms, and almost all of them end in P, uh, being for protocol. And so let's just review uh, really quickly what the DHCP protocol might look like. So last week, we kind of looked at it at this higher level, where a client is requesting an IP, and the server sends it an IP, and we go through this process. So here are just kind of the formal names for the steps of this process. So in the first step, this client sends out this message called the DHCP broadcast, which we said before, this lets everyone on the network know, hey, I'm a new client. I don't know where to go, but I need a new IP address. So that's the DHCP broadcast. And this is the first step of the protocol. 
you know, the client isn't going to be kind of out of line or ridiculous for doing this. He's following the same protocol that everyone else is going to follow if they want an IP on the network. So now, the other member of this exchange is the DHCP server, remember, and the server is also aware of this protocol. So it doesn't matter what kind of computer this client is because it's following the protocol and the server is also going to follow the same set of rules. So the set of rules dictates that, okay, whenever I receive a DHCP broadcast, if I'm a DHCP server, I'm going to send a DHCP offer, which remember said, okay, here's an IP address that if you want it, uh, or sorry, that says I am the DHCP server, I'm offering you some help. So the next step is the client is going to send a message called a DHCP request. That's going to say, hey, I'm a client, I'm looking for an IP address, can you help me out? And finally, the DHCP server is going to say, yep, I'm going to give you an IP address. And basically the same process that we saw last week. But now there are actually this formal set of rules where each one of these steps has a defined name. So one of the more common protocols that you probably use every day is this thing called HTTP, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. So we're not just transferring text, we're transferring hypertext. So last week we said a lot of things about making requests from clients to different servers. You know, we said that I'm a client, I'm requesting information from CNN.com or Google.com. We just kind of left it at that. We said, I'm requesting information. But what does that really mean? Right? Like what, it, what goes into a request? What does it look like to request information as a client from a server? So that's what we're going to look at now. And that's something that's dictated by the rules of HTTP. So just a quick review. Last week, we made this distinction between clients and servers. So clients, remember, are kind of the ones asking the question and making the request. And servers are the ones responding to that request. So a CNN.com server is just some special computer in some warehouse somewhere that's going, whose purpose in life is just to respond to questions made by any clients to get information from CNN.com. So typically, when we're on the web, when we're using HTTP, these requests are going to come from a special program on our computer called a web browser. So web browsers include things like Google Chrome or Firefox or Microsoft Internet Explorer. And these are just programs that other people wrote that kind of handle this process for us, this sending of requests to servers and handling the response that the server sends back. But all of these web browsers on almost any web page whose URL looks like this is going to be communicating using HTTP. And that's why these URLs are prefixed with this HTTP colon slash slash. That just says, I want some information from at the information located at some URL and I want to retrieve it using the HTTP protocol. So there's some other protocols that we'll look at, but a URL like this says, I'm sending you a request following the rules of HTTP, and I want you to send me a response also following the rules of HTTP. So here's what a really, really, really basic HTTP request could look like. So you can see that this is just kind of plain text, and it's actually kind of human readable. So let's break this down. So the first word you see here, this get, is called the HTTP method, or the HTTP verb. And this describes what do we want from the server. So here we're looking to get some information. So HTTP says, well, if you want to get some information, the first word in your HTTP request should be the word get. In all capital letters, I'm not just yelling at you. This is something that HTTP says. So then there's going to be a space. And again, this is not just something I put in there. This is what H a rule that HTTP dictates. After the space, there's going to be some path. So I'm looking for a file called home.php. I haven't said where that's located yet, but somewhere on the server I'm contacting, I should get some information from home.php. And this is just the path component from the URLs, which we looked at last week. So after that, we're going to have another space. And now we're going to specify the version of HTTP. There are actually a couple different versions of HTTP. Um, HTTP 1.0 is kind of old. 1.1 is kind of the version we use now. And some people at Google and other uh, tech companies like that are starting to develop HTTP 2.0, uh, which some call uh, SPDY or Speedy, because uh, it's going to be much faster uh, than HTTP 1.1. But for now, this is just kind of the norm. And we're just telling whatever server we're contacting, hey, by the way, I'm using this version. So, these are the so everyone's on the same page in terms of what features are going to be supported by the request and the response. So that's the version, just letting everyone know uh, what page we're on. And finally, we have this thing called an HTTP header. And these are going to be, as we saw last week, just key value pairs. So first, we have on the left here a key. This key is called host. 
we're going to be associating some information with this key. So we're going to separate keys and values now with a colon. And on the right of the colon is going to be the value. So I want to request from the host www.facebook.com. So we can see here, kind of at the top, we've split our URL into two things. So down the bottom here, we kind of have the domain that we're requesting information from. And then at the top, we have kind of the second half of the URL, which is the path that we're requesting on this domain right here. So any questions so far on what an HTTP request looks like? Yeah? I didn't really understand what you meant by path. Is that like, like home, does that indicate like the home page of Facebook? Is that what you mean? Or I don't, I don't understand what path is. Yeah, so what do we mean by path? So let me switch over. So that HTTP request we just saw was the same as typing in, or would a request would be generated by typing in something like facebook.com slash home.php. So if I, in a web browser, went to this URL, the HTTP request that would be generated, we split up into two parts. So this slash home.php is the path. And this other part here, this facebook.com or www.facebook.com, that's going to be the host kind of the domain that we're contacting. So HTTP just says, well, we're going to split up these two things inside of the request. So the path is something located on some server, and that server is called facebook.com. So we can use this thing uh, called Telnet, which is just a little program that's going to allow me to make HTTP requests myself. So rather than like Google Chrome kind of handle formulating my HTTP request for me, I'm going to actually manually type it in so we can really get a sense of what's going on. So if I type in telnutgoogle.com, what I'm going to do is I'm going to establish a connection to google.com. This is nice, but I haven't actually requested any information yet. I just have this connection, and there's kind of nothing flowing on it back and forth yet. So now let me type in an HTTP request. So what's the first thing I need? So I want to get google.com's homepage. So in my HTTP request, what's the first thing I should type? Get, yeah, exactly. So I want to get some information. So I'm going to type in the word get. So let's just say that the path I'm looking for is nothing. So I'm just going to say it's the same as google.com slash, and then there's nothing after that slash. So that's my path. So what comes next? What was the last thing in the first line of our HTTP request? Yeah, so exactly, the HTTP version. So I'm going to say I'm using HTTP, whoop, not that, HTTP. <laughs> slash 1.1. So that's the version of HTTP I'm using. Now I'm going to hit Enter. Nothing happened yet, so I haven't really created a full HTTP request. So what do I need to specify now? Yeah, so I need to say now, what's the domain that I'm requesting information from? So that's also called the host. So I'm going to type in host colon www.google.com. Now I press Enter twice, I get back. A response. So what this actually is, is this is what Google's home page would look like inside of your web browser. Now we're just kind of looking at the textual version of it, rather than the result of kind of rendering that into a web page. So if we scroll up a little bit, scroll up a lot, scroll up a real lot. All right. As we can see here, that not only did Google respond with the contents of the page, but it also responded with something that kind of looks like the HTTP request that we just made. And this thing here is called the HTTP response. And so just like our request had these headers that were associated with it, they were also going to have headers associated with the HTTP response. So they're kind of going to be formatted and uh, a little bit similar. So the first thing that happens in an HTTP response is, again, going to be this version just to confirm that if we, we requested it with version 1.1, we're going to get something back that is also version 1.1. So the next thing here, does anyone know what this is called? The 200 OK? So this is the HTTP status code. So this status code basically tells us whether or not our request was successful or not. And since we just went to google.com, that seems pretty successful. We got back what looks like a web page, so nothing really went wrong there. Google is able to successfully transfer some information back to me because I made a request. Has anyone ever seen this status code? So when, so when do we see this? Yeah, exactly. So if we type in a URL, 
that points to something that doesn't exist on a server, they're going to send back, rather than this status code 200, which said that everything went OK, well, this time everything didn't go OK, right? We tried to access something that doesn't exist, and that's not so good. And so the server wants to let the client know, hey, you tried to request something that doesn't exist. And so I can't just send you back you know, some information. I need to explicitly tell you that, hey, your request did not succeed. So some uh, popular 404 pages uh, that I really like are one from GitHub, a Star Wars reference here. And if you're really bored, if you actually move your mouse around it, it kind of moves a little bit. I don't know why. <laughs> so so there's, there's one reference. There's also, uh, if you're kind of having a bad day, we have 404, looks like this page doesn't exist. Bad news is best broken with baby animals. Here's a bunny. And finally, if you're really bored, this 404 page happens to have a game of Pac-Man that is fully playable. Yeah, no, not very good at Pac-Man, but you get the idea. So these are all different 404 pages. And now these are just kind of cute and funny ways of informing you in your web browser that you tried to go to something that doesn't actually exist. So all of these pages actually sent back a different status code. So in addition uh, to a cute game of Pac-Man, somewhere at the top of that HTT response, instead of saying 200 OK, it actually said 404 not found. And so that's a way of letting the client know that they didn't actually find something. So why is this necessary, right? So what if I go to a page slash 404 and I get back a Pac-Man game? Somehow the client needs to know, well, was the user looking for a Pac-Man game or was the user looking for something else and the server responded with a Pac-Man game? So that's why we need this additional HTTP header. The client just can't figure out based on what's sent back from the server, whether or not it was found or not found or something went wrong. So we need to explicitly have the status code that lets the client know, hey, you tried to do something you can't do or everything went through OK. And so here are some other uh, common status codes. So we saw this top one, this 200 OK. And we also have now something like a 301. And a 301 tells us that what we're looking for isn't found here, but I actually know where it is. So this is commonly called a redirect. And this can happen when you try to go to a URL, and your web browser says, actually, you know, if it wasn't found, but the server actually told me another URL that contains what I'm looking for. So you might go to one URL and then see a quick flash and your browser's URL changes. That's called a redirect. That's having the server tell you, hey, you, we need to go somewhere else in order to find where you're looking for. And so your web browser will just kind of take it upon itself to say, OK, well, if the server told me to go to uh, github.com slash something, I'm just going to go there rather than letting the user wait or having uh, anything else. Just kind of automatically go and find what the server where the server said to go. So similarly, uh, we have this 302. The difference here being um, HTTP makes a difference between kind of temporarily moved and permanently moved. And so this 302 says, well, it's found over here, but I don't know if it's going to be permanently there, um, but whatever. Effectively, these two things accomplish the same thing, just kind of sending your browser to a different URL when something's not found. So next, uh, we have this 400 bad request. So that means that somehow there is a syntax error in my HTTP. So if, for example, if we come back here, and I send kind of a badly formatted request. If I say something like, hello, HTTP 1.1 get or host. So Google is going to say, oh, this is a different one. But basically, so there was some error with my HTTP request. So in this case, I tried to use a method that's not allowed, which is just a different status code. So if I had messed something else up in my HTTP request, maybe I misspelled something. Instead, the server could respond with something that starts with a 4. That just says, it's kind of your fault, client. You sent me something that I, I have no idea what that is, and I can't respond to it. Um, so you need to send me a request that I can actually respond to. So then we have these two here, uh, this 401 and this 403. And these are basically different ways of saying that there's some resource on a server, but you're not allowed to access it. So maybe the person on the server has said, you know, only I can read this file, or uh, restricted access to certain folders on the server or something like that. Or also, we saw last week that we can kind of log in using a URL. So this file that you're trying to access could be kind of password protected. And if that's the case, then you're going to get a 401, because unless you have, you supply the correct username and password, you're not authorized to view that file. 
with this 403 forbidden says, no matter what username and password you give me, you will just never be able to access it because of some permissions or the way that the server is set up. Someone has said, this file here just cannot be accessed publicly over the web. So we saw 404. And finally, we have this one down here, this 500 internal server error. And this happens if somehow the server actually messed up the request. So these 400s are when the client messes up. These 500s now are when the server messes up. So maybe there's some code running on the server that encountered an error. And the server doesn't really know what to do because kind of something is broken. It's going to respond to the client saying, hey, I'm broken, so I can't respond to your request. So here's a 500. So each of these digits then uh, can kind of be broken down into different categories. So these ones here are actually not too common. Uh, they're just kind of providing some information. Um, so we don't really see those. Uh, everything that starts with a 2 says, here's a successful request. Everything that starts with a 3 says, I'm going to redirect your browser, saying, I know where the thing you're looking for is. You should go over here. Everything starting with a 4, as we saw, is something wrong with the client. They sent a, a bad HTTP request that didn't make sense, and I can't respond to it. And finally, everything that ends with 5 is something wrong on the server. So the request was totally valid, uh, but somehow something on the server messed up. So any questions on status codes? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that's not something typically that you'd see. Right. But if we come back here and I scroll up again, so everything, this whole blob of text is actually the response. And the first line of this response is this HTTP 1.1, 200 OK. And so this is actually what the server is sending back. But the web browser knows that if you went to google.com, you're probably not looking for the text 200 OK. You're probably only looking for what's below all of these headers. And so that's all the web browser will display to you. But yeah, every HTTP, HTTP response is going to have these key value pairs at the top of it. Yeah? Yeah, so, so, what are, so what are some history of some different web browsers? Um, so there'll actually be a, a fun little recap that goes kind of through internet history, because I think it's, it's super interesting, but we just won't have time to cover it. Um, but you may have heard some, of some web browsers called Netscape Navigator, uh, which has the little N with the uh, little star that goes around it. Um, an earlier one was called Mosaic. Um, and eventually, Netscape Navigator uh, became known as a, a more browser we're more familiar with, uh, Firefox. Uh, and that kind of started off a while ago. And then Google Chrome is kind of uh, newer to the scene. So Firefox has been around for a while. Google Chrome said, yeah, Firefox is great, but we want to improve on it even more. And then kind of on the other side of things, we have uh, Apple Safari, uh, which is something that ships with every version of Mac OS X right now. Originally, uh, Mac used, or not originally, but a few, many years ago with like Mac OS, S, OS 8, which was a while ago, the Mac used to ship a version of Internet Explorer uh, just for Macs, uh, when Microsoft and Apple used to have a uh, friendship that does not exist anymore. And then finally, Internet Explorer uh, has also been around for a while. Um, but so yeah, so there's kind of a, a history where different browsers kind of forked off to form different new browsers and improve upon each other. And so kind of now, we're at the state where you have a, different, a bunch of different competing browsers. That actually ends up kind of being a good thing, right? Because if Google introduces this whole new feature, then Firefox is going to say, oh crap, Google's now a better browser. I better implement this new feature too. While we're at it, maybe I'll add something that Google doesn't have. And so that it kind of ends up uh, improving the browser ecosystem for everybody. Except in some cases, when some kind of uh, browsers kind of lag behind, uh, like Microsoft Internet Explorer is kind of infamous for kind of, uh, lagging behind in features, uh, like browser tabs were something that you know Firefox had for a really long time, and just Internet Explorer didn't have forever. And you might notice that some with some older versions of Internet Explorer, web pages just don't render correctly. And that's because Internet Explorer is just kind of lacking some features. So you kind of have this dichotomy between when you're making a website, as we'll see, you know, do I want to make sure my website displays in these older browsers that don't support all these newest features versus this cool new thing I can do, but only if you're on the latest version of Firefox. So there's definitely some, some really interesting history there. OK, so let's jump back to our HTTP response. So the next line is pretty self-explanatory. It's just the date. And this is the date at which the server responded to my request. So I made a request at some time. The server took some time to process it and send it back. And this is the time at which the server finished processing my HTTP request. So after that, we have this thing called the server. 
And the server, remember, is just the machine that responded to my request. And so this server key tells me a little bit about the, cert the machine that actually responded to me. So this here says something about Apache and something else about something called Fedora. So in order for a web server to send us back content, it's probably running some special software that handles HTTP requests that come in and responding to those HTTP requests. So one of those pieces of software is called Apache. This is a really popular one uh, that runs on a lot of web servers all around the world. And in parentheses here, Fedora. Does anyone happen to know what Fedora is, other than a stylish hat? Yeah, so it's a Linux distribution. So Linux, like Windows and OS X, is just another operating system. It happens to come in a variety of flavors, and Fedora is just one such flavor. And so this uh, was an HTTP response uh, from CSE1.net, which happens to be running Apache and Fedora. If, on the other hand, I made a request uh, to another website, which we can do. So if I instead connect to Microsoft, NET, Microsoft.com, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say, I want to send a GET request to nothing with version 1.1 of HTTP. And the host I'm connecting to is www.microsoft.com. And I hit Enter. We can see here that this value of server is different. Right? There's probably not a good chance that a server powering Microsoft.com is not running Windows. And so this server here is just a different value. This server now is not running Apache and Fedora. It's running so software written by Microsoft, which makes sense because this is now Microsoft.com. So out of curiosity, not all HTTP responses include this extra information. So why might I want to hide this from a client? Why might not I always want to tell the client about the server? Yeah, exactly. So we don't want them to know what operating system. So why might we not want them to know? What's one reason? Yeah, so there could be some bias. We could say, well, it looks like everyone's running Microsoft. Maybe I should run Microsoft too. So how about what's another reason? Security, yeah. So let's say that. I read online that someone just hacked Microsoft IIS version 7.5. If I know now that, hey, I found a server that's running Microsoft IIS 7.5, and I just found out that there's some problem in that, so in that software, I can now go and attack this server, which isn't so good. If instead I did not tell people that I was running Microsoft IIS 7.5, then an attacker wouldn't really know if their attack would work. And they'd be kind of wasting their time trying because it could be running Linux, and the, the bug might not apply. So as a security reason, there's really no reason to tell the client what kind of software I'm running. Right? The client doesn't really care. The client's going to display Google.com no matter what kind of server software we're, we're running. So it's kind of a bit of a vulnerability to tell it this additional information, because they can take advantage of some exploits in this version of the software. So up next, we have this content length. And this one's pretty straightforward. This is just how many bytes the response is going to be. So this is about 2 kilobytes, uh, which is pretty small, because as you saw, we just got back not a whole lot of text, a lot of scrolling, um, but not that much text. Next, we say, what type of content is the response? So here, after the semicolon, we see this thing, UTF-8, which is a character encoding that we saw back in lecture one. And so this is now telling the client how the information is going to be encoded. So they know that if they see a sequence that represents a snowman, that the client should display a snowman and not something else, because we're kind of agreeing on this encoding of characters. Because at the end of the day, remember, anything transferred anywhere, really, is just going to be binary, this series of zeros and ones. So we need to know how to interpret those zeros and ones. So to the left of the semicolon, we see this thing text slash HTML. And so HTML is something we'll look at in much more detail later in the term. We'll learn how to create websites with it. But for now, HTML is just this basic system for creating structure to your web pages. So HTML looks something like this. So this HTML is going to create what's called a header. So basically some big block of text, maybe at the top of a web page, that displays something. So on the left here, we have what's called a start tag. And we have a less than sign to start it off. Then we have some characters. And we see here an h1, which means I have the largest header I possibly can. So on the right of that, we have the end tag. And so this basically creates some boundaries. So we have an h1 that says my header is going to start here. Then we have an end tag that says my header is going to end right here. 
So in between these two tags, we have the actual value, which is what text your web browser would actually display. And so this is the HTML that might display um, the big heading that you see at the top of CSE1.net that would say CSE1. So don't worry too much about the specifics of HTML right now, because we'll look at that in much more detail later in the term. But this is the basic structure of what a web page is going to send back so that your web browser can display it. So finally, um, this last line here just says, OK, I've sent you all the information that I can send you, so go ahead and close the connection, because I don't have any additional information to send once I've finished this HTTP response. So any questions on that response? Yeah. Yeah, so under what circumstances would the connection remain open? So if you've noticed, uh, maybe on CSE1 Discuss, uh, when a new question comes in, you actually don't have to refresh the page. So if you ever happen to be looking at the inbox and just like, saw something come in without refreshing the page, that's because the browser is actually maintaining this constant connection to the server. And so the browser says, OK, whenever you get a new message, just send it over this connection. If I didn't keep this open, then what I'd have to do is basically keep asking the server maybe every five seconds, is there a new question? Is there a new question? So that'd be kind of inefficient, because I have to keep going over and over and over. I'd waste the server's time, because there's not a new question a lot of the time. So by keeping this connection open, I can kind of avoid that. OK, so let's look at a different type of HTTP request. So now, uh, rather than just uh, looking for any old path, remember that inside of a URL, we can also pass some information to the server. We're passing this in in this thing called a query string. And a query string, again, has these key value pairs. So here we have a key of Q, Q for query, and we have a value of cats. So if it went to google.com and typed in this URL, it would actually search for cats for me. And so this is just one way of transferring information to the server. But what if we want to do more than just get information, which we do a lot of the time? So if, for example, we're logging into facebook.com, the purpose of that request is to let Facebook know who I am. I'm not getting any new information from Facebook. I'm posting some information. And so now we have a different HTTP method called post. And what post says is it's just kind of what it sounds like. I'm not getting information. I'm sending you some information, and you're going to do something with it. So the request looks pretty similar, except our, now our verb or method is post. And down here, we have the body of the HTTP request. So just like in a response, we have the headers at the top and the body at the bottom. Similarly, in a request, we can have the headers at the top and some body at the bottom. So here's what the HTTP request for me logging into Facebook or Gmail might look like. Down at the bottom here, we have another query string with some key value pairs. And I'm sending it a username and, of course, my actual password. And so now, this is how I can send some information to a server without putting it in the URL. Of course, this isn't any more secure than putting it in a URL, because as we see uh, in RJ section video this week, we can actually see all of the traffic that's going on around you on a wireless network, for example. But it's a little bit nicer to not, when you log into Facebook to not see a URL uh, with your username and your password just sitting there so someone looking over your shoulder can read it. And also, semantically, if we're logging in and we're sending Facebook some information, to use a verb, get, is just kind of the wrong word, because we're not really getting any information. So web browsers uh, have a tool for kind of examining the HTTP requests that come in when you go to a web page. So if I come back over here to Google Chrome, so if I go to the menu up here in the top right, so web browsers uh, oh, have a again. tool for kind of examining I come up here in the top right, and I go to Tools, Developer Tools. What this does down here is this opens up this thing at the bottom. And this allows me uh, to basically see all of the HTTP requests and responses that are being generated by my web browser. So if I never come to this page again, so I don't hear myself, and click on Lectures, suddenly we have a whole bunch of stuff down here in this Network tab. So at the top, we can see here that we made an HTTP GET the response was a 200 OK, so it went well. And we got back some text and some HTML. So if I click this now, I can actually see all of the headers that my web browser generated. So even though in our simple HTTP requests, all we did was we specified a host, your browser can also specify some additional information. Like this one down here, for example, my user agent. 
And this is actually telling the server some information about me as a web browser. So last week we mentioned that this is one way in which sites can determine if you're on a mobile device. If I send you a user agent that rather than saying Intel Mac OS X 10.8.2 said something like iPhone 6.0, then that server would know that I'm on an iPhone and not on a desktop. So even though I just went to one web page, I actually have a whole bunch of different HTTP requests here. So for example, I'm requesting a file here called e1.css. And the reason being that inside of the HTML response to my HTTP request, I could be basically linking out to some other resources. So if I have an image on the page, for example, that image won't be sent in the original response. Instead, the response will basically say, hey, in order to display this image, you need to make another HTTP request to this URL. So that means that inside of the HTML at cse1.net, I'm telling the web browser, hey, in order to display this page, you need to make a bunch of other HTTP requests and get some other stuff. And so we'll see later that CSS is just basically some additional information uh, that makes the page look pretty. So things like colors and fonts uh, will be encoded using HCSS. So these were um, some recently released photos uh, from Google's data centers. Uh, and they're super, super cool. So when you go to google.com, you know, you're probably one of billions of people going to google.com right that second. And so that means that Google has to have a whole bunch of servers that are ready to respond to requests to google.com. And so here, for example, uh, is what one of their data centers looks like. So each one of these little blue lights here is actually a different server. So we just have racks of these things. We have a bunch of servers ready to respond to your HTTP requests. And these are just really, really cool. If you Google around for uh, Google data centers, they just released a bunch of uh, like really well taken photos of all of their data centers. Of course, um, we still run into issues of load or capacity, right? So during the presidential inauguration, uh, a bunch of people were tweeting about the inauguration speech, because uh, that's just what you do now. And so Twitter actually had some problems where so many people were tweeting at the same time that suddenly all of Twitter servers, even though there's a bunch of them, they just couldn't handle all of the requests that are coming in. So that means that one solution could be to you know, add more servers or maybe make each of the servers more efficient. Uh, but this is why huge companies like Google just can't have one server responding to all of the requests. Right? If one of these single blue lights breaks, I think Google is still going to be OK. They still have tens of thousands of other servers ready to go. And so that's why uh, large companies will have a bunch of servers. So when we saw the response uh, to getting Google.com, it looked something like this. And this is just basically a huge blob of text. And so if I'm actually writing the code for Google.com, I probably don't want to be writing this huge blob of text. But why might Google want to make sure that the response that I send is as small as possible? Yeah, so bandwidth, right? So if Google wants to send a large response, it's going to take a while for it to get to me. And it's also going to cost Google some money, right? So they have to pay somebody to help transfer some ISP to send that information to my client. And so that means that if I add, for example, one more character or like a space somewhere, that's going to be another byte or maybe two bytes, depending on how much damage I do, to every single response to Google.com. So that means that if there are, for example, a billion hits to Google.com in some span of time, and every one of those hits is suddenly one or four or 10 bytes larger, that means that not only uh, am I sending more information that I don't need to and kind of slowing down how long it takes to access Google.com, I'm costing a whole lot of money that I don't need to cause. So what Google will do is compress all of their website's information and basically remove everything that they possibly can. So there's no space here, and it's formatted pretty badly. But Google went through a lot of effort to make this as small as possible so that if this information could reach me even faster, because Google's just sending less of it. So similarly, uh, if we go to reddit.com, uh, which I would not recommend doing if you have any deadline whatsoever, and we open up uh, this network tab again, and I refresh, and I kind of scroll up a little bit, I'm going to see that one of the images that came back to me looks like something I can't find, but it looks like this. And so what this is is called a sprite. 
It's basically a single image that inside of it has all of the different images that might ever appear anywhere on Reddit. So at the top here, um, these could be some different navigation bars that could appear. We have the logo for Reddit. And then down here, we have all of these little icons that will at some point appear on the same page. So it looks like we have a whole bunch of images in order to make you know, Reddit look good, or try to look good. So in order to download all of these images, we would normally have to make a separate HTTP request for every single one of these images. And so that's really inefficient. Right? Why am I making one HTTP request for this blue arrow, and then a whole other HTTP request for this white arrow? So in order to prevent the need to make all of these different HTTP requests, what Reddit did was it just kind of slammed all these images into one. So now we make a single HTTP request, we get all of the images, and then later the browser will just kind of figure out, OK, well, inside of this big, huge image, there's some kind of box that represents the logo. And so if I jump down halfway and kind of cut this part out, then in the web browser, I can display just that logo. But I didn't need to make an HTTP request to each of these images separately. And so really, this is just another way that servers are trying to be clever and more efficient. So they're preventing clients from having to make all of these HTTP requests to save themselves time and money. So now, uh, let's take a five minute break. And when we come back, uh, we're going to take a look at email. All right, welcome back. So now, uh, we kind of saw what it's like to browse the web and see what our browser is doing underneath the hood as we go visit different pages with cat videos. And so now, we're going to take a look at email. And what happens now under the hood when we go and we send emails containing cat videos to each other. So whether we're using Outlook.com or Gmail.com or our mail client on our iPhone, we kind of have the same basic idea. We're going to need some kind of protocols to facilitate communication between different types of devices. So I need some protocol that tells my iPhone how to interact with Gmail in order to send an email to someone at a Microsoft with a Microsoft email address. So again, we just need this idea of protocol to facilitate communication be between two different kinds of devices. So the protocol that we'll take a look at for sending email is called SMTP, or the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. And again, SMTP just defines this set of rules that describe how a client and a server should communicate with each other in order to send an email. So the process of sending an email actually looks something like this. So even though you kind of pull out your iPhone and click send, and then a couple seconds later your message ends up on someone else's iPhone, you're actually not communicating directly with that person's iPhone. Instead, what's happening is you on the left here, who's sending an email, you're actually sending your email to what's called an SMTP server. And so this server is basically going to use the SMTP protocol to communicate both with you and with some other server. So my SMTP server might be owned by Google, if I have a gmail.com address. So I log into gmail.com, and I type up a message, and I hit send. That message first goes to a Google SMTP server. So now I, I sent the email to somebody. So let's say they have an address at live.com, which is a Microsoft service. So now the Google SMTP server is going to forward that message along to an SMTP server owned by Microsoft. So that means that that's how we're actually transferring the email from my email address to a Microsoft email address. So now, if a person on the other end, on the receiving end of my email, uses their mail client to check their email, that's now going to contact the Microsoft server and kind of pull down the email that I sent. So we kind of have this four-step, three-step process here for actually sending an email. I'm not actually going directly from my device to another device. I'm kind of going through these other two servers that are using SMTP on the way. So when I send an email, we said that it's going to get sent to one of Google's SMTP servers. But at any given amount of time, I'm probably not the only one who's sending an email using a gmail.com address. So what's actually going to happen is my email message is going to hit one of Google's SMTP servers, and it's not going to send right away, but it's probably going to join what's called a queue. So basically, a long line of other emails that are waiting to be sent on that same server. So has anyone ever been to Disney World uh, and written this? Right? So, this, so this, is the, this is the rock and roller coaster. So basically, what, what happens is you, kinda, you sit down on a roller coaster, and it goes like 0 to 60 in some very small number of seconds. And they're kind of blaring Aerosmith at like speakers and the seat. Oh, it's incredible. 
Uh, but the point being is that this thing usually has a very long queue of people waiting for it. So when the park opens up, uh, people like me who are really excited to get their fix of Aerosmith at 8 in the morning are going to be first in line. And then later, so you know, someone might arrive at you know, 10 p.m. and join the line. And it might be really unfair if that person who joined the line at 10 a.m. got to enjoy Steven Tyler before I got to. Right? I got there first, so maybe we should let me in and kind of the or let people in in the order that they got there. And so this kind of format for letting people into something is called a queue. So if, for example, the line looks like this, and Ben's at the front of the line and I'm at the end of the line, if we have a queue, the order we kind of take things out of this list is we're going to take them out in the order they came in. So Ben was here first, so that means when we remove something from this list, you know, it's, kinda, it's Ben's turn to get on the roller coaster, that means we're going to kind of take Ben out and shift Tommy and RJ forward. So again, if it's someone else's turn, the next person to come out is RJ, and finally the next person to come out is me. And so this is uh, how we would kind of process people as they were standing in a line. And so as your emails are sent to Google SMTP server, this is how they're going to be processed. The first one there is going to be the first one to be sent. So the opposite way uh, of thinking about things is called a stack. So now, instead of thinking about a line of people waiting for the rock and roller coaster, let's instead think of a stack of plates. So that means the first plate you put down on the stack is going to be at the bottom. So if I put another plate down on the stack, it's going to be on top of that one. So eventually, let's say I have a, a stack of plates that's 100 plates tall. Now I want to remove a plate from the list. A really bad idea would be to take out the plate that I put down first. Because if that's at the bottom of the pile, that means that everything is going to fall over. So a more sensible thing to do if I needed a plate from my stack of plates would be to take it from the top. And so that means that actually the last plate to get onto the stack was the first one to be removed. So if we go back to the same scenario, we have this line here. So Ben's at the front of the line, followed by RJ and me. A stack would say that the last person to get in line is the first person to be removed. So I would get removed first, followed by RJ, followed by Ben. So we call this difference the difference between a stack and a queue. So hopefully your SMTP server is using a queue, meaning that the emails are processed in the order they come in. There are some other contexts that we will see later in which you instead want a stack. Kind of the most recent thing to come in is the first thing to come out. So does that distinction make sense? OK, so I'm an SMTP server, and someone just sent me an email. So that email is addressed to someone, and their email address has to look something like this. So we've all seen email addresses probably every day. On the left here, we have some unique identifier, followed by an at sign, uh, followed by some website. So if I'm an SMTP server, and I just see something like this, this name at website.com, I now need to figure out what SMTP server to send this to. So what's the first thing I probably need to do with this email address? Yeah, so we're going to look at the domain. And so we've seen that we can use IP addresses to contact other machines on the internet. But all I have here is a domain. So I'm an SMTP server. What do I do? Yeah, so we try to find it. So what's the, name, what's the name of the technology or the protocol we can use? Yeah, so we're going to use DNS now. So just like before, when your web browser needed to make a request to Google.com, the first thing that needed to happen was that Google.com needed to be converted into an IP address, because that's how we're going to make communications over a network. So with an SMTP server, we're going to have the same thing. We have a domain, and we now need an IP address. So we're going to use the exact same process that we saw before. We're going to go through the whole process of looking something up using DNS. So we have our root servers, our TLD servers, and the same exact thing as before. So that means that we're going to reach this first server. I'm now going to use DNS to look up the IP address of another SMTP server. And by the way, how can we distinguish between the IP address of gmail.com and the IP address that emails sent to gmail.com look to. Does anyone remember a distinction we made last week with different types of DNS records? Uh, a record a yeah, exactly. So we had these things called an A record. And an A record said that this is the IP address that's associated with this domain. So there's, so there's another type of record that's not quite a C name. It's another one that we said would be used with email. Does anyone remember what it is? MSQL. 
Yeah, an MX record. So that's going to be mail exchange. So now, when I'm an SFTP server, I don't care about the web address for gmail.com. What I care about is what machine I need to send this email to so that it can be delivered using SMTP. And so now we're just going to use that other type of DNS record. We're now looking for the IP address associated with the MX record for whatever email address I'm sending to. So the machines that are powering gmail.com and machines that are receiving emails to gmail.com might be different. And that's going to depend on the DNS that's set up on gmail.com. Any questions? OK, so again, we're just using the same process called DNS to go from human readable domain name to IP address that we can use to communicate over the internet. So just like we had HTTP headers, we're also going to have email headers. So again, these are just kind of specified by SMTP. And we just have this much longer list uh, of key value pairs that are associated with an email. And so using these email headers, we can actually trace the path my email took to get from point A to point B. So we actually want to read these uh, from bottom to top. So at the bottom here, we can see, again, just a date for the email, the email subject, which is just a key value pair in the header. That's where that subject comes from in Gmail. Then we have who the email is being sent to. So that's my email address. We have who the email is being sent from. That's also my email address. And then we see this thing up here that says received. And so this says it, re it was received by some IP address, which is nice, something, 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 dot hotmail, dot com. So which SMTP server is this? Yeah, so this is the sending SMTP server. Based on these headers, it looks like I'm sending from a Microsoft email address to a Gmail address. So the first thing that this email did is it went from my client on Outlook.com and it went to one of Microsoft's SMTP servers. So now let's keep going up and look at this next line. And so this one's a little bit longer. But now it says, received from something.hotmail.com by mx.google.com. So what just happened in this step? Yeah, no, that's exactly right, yeah. So the receiving server just received my email. So now in step two. So I first said my email will be sent to the Microsoft SMTP server. The Microsoft SMTP server said, OK, I'm looking for gmail.com. I use DNS to look that up, and I get an IP address. I'm now going to send that email to that IP address. And that IP address represents an SMTP server owned by google.com. And so this mx.google.com is just referring to that MX record or mail exchange record. So this is just the name of Google's MX server. And so in this step here, we went from Microsoft SMTP server to Google SMTP server. So my email isn't quite delivered yet because it's still sitting on someone else's server. And so we have one more line here. And this line is the equivalent of saying, OK, I logged into gmail.com. And that means that gmail.com contacted the SMTP server and it said, hey, do you have any new emails? If so, then I need them, which means the SMTP server basically sent this to my web browser. So to be more specific, it sent it to a web server that's powering gmail.com, and that web server then sent it to me. But only that first step there, where it travels from SMTP server to now a web server, which is now going to start using HTTP to interact with me, and that's the step that gets recorded in the email header here. So any questions so we can kind of see the path an email took? Yeah? What's the, the 1245 and then the 945? What's the 1245? Oh, yeah. So we have 1245 and 945. So these are probably just different time zones. So we see here we have this uh, minus 500, uh, which I think is Eastern time. Uh, but Google's server happens to be using uh, Pacific time. So we have PST there. So it actually didn't take uh, three hours for my email to reach uh, from Microsoft to Google. It actually took, let's see, so we went from 9.45 to 9.46. So it took about 20 seconds for my email to be delivered. Yeah, so a little, little deceptive if the two servers are on different time zones. 
Other questions? So how did I get this? So if I log into gmail.com, we can see here that I'm the proud owner of Unicode Love Hotel at gmail.com. Emails sent to that address will be processed faster than any other emails. And I have an email here. And it looks like somebody wrote me telling me how much uh, they love cats, and I, I can't disagree. But now inside of the Gmail UI, if I click on this thing here that says More, and I get this little drop-down menu, I see this option here that says Show Original. I'm going to click this, and I get this wall, big wall of text that is exactly the email headers that we were just looking at. So again, we could, we could trace the delivery of this message by reading these things from bottom to top. And we're going to see that it's basically the same process. I'm sending to some SMTP server, which sends the message to a Gmail SMTP server, which sends the message to me. So that's just the headers. So how about the actual content of the email? So let's look at our content type, because I'm curious how my content is actually formatted. So we have something new here, this multi-part slash alternative. And that's something we haven't really seen before. Uh, but it seems to me like this multi-part seems to suggest that the email will be sent in multiple parts. So if we scroll down here, we see this thing here that says content type text plain. And then I have just an email address. This is just, uh, sorry, an email message. This is just ASCII text, nothing fancy here. But now, it looks like I have this random string of characters. And what this random string of characters is actually doing is it's separating the different parts of my email. So you can see here that we saw this thing boundary. And if we're sending this email in multiple parts, then we need some way of delineating one part from another part. And the way email is doing this is by constructing this really large string that hopefully doesn't occur anywhere in my email, and then basically putting it between these messages. So the other part here is basically the same message, but we can see here that we have some HTML. And so we have basically the same exact email message, but the one on top here is only using plain text, and the one on bottom here is actually using some email. So why might we want to like send this message twice? Isn't that redundant and will take longer? What are some advantages to having both this plain version and this HTML version? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. Okay. So some email clients, they basically want to display HTML. And if you allow users to start typing HTML, they can do things like change the font to Comic Sans, make the text blink and, gl uh, blink and glittery, and all these other things that make it unreadable. And that might be what you want. Your, your email client could say, if I get some HTML, I'm going to display it and kind of allow me to make my text fancier. On the other hand, you might want to say in your email client, I don't want you know, any formatting with my emails. I just want to look at the plain text. I'm boring. And so this might be why you send this plain text version. So now the user kind of has two different options for reading this email. They can look at the formatted one, or they can look at the non-formatted one. And the way that email, uh, this is actually happens in an email is by literally sending it twice in multiple parts with this random string of characters kind of separating the plain version and the HTML version. Make sense? OK. So now let's actually look at the protocol that's used for sending email. And to do that, just like I did before, I can use a little program on my computer to talk directly to one of Google's SMTP servers. So last time we used this thing called Telnet, and that allowed me to type things in, and I typed in some HTTP requests. Now I'm going to use this other thing uh, called OpenSSL Client, which is basically just like Telnet. I'm basically just going to be typing in a message that will just be sent to a server, and the server can respond to me. Um, but this is just a little bit more secure. So we don't have to worry about what all these other things mean. Um, but just notice that I'm connecting to a server called smtp.gmail.com. So I hit Enter, and I get all of this stuff. But at the end here, I'm prompted uh, to type something. So that means I'm connected to the server, and I'm ready to send something along that connection. So I'm going to type in, hello. Unfortunately spelled wrong, but if I send a message, H-E-L-O, hello, to the SMTP server, the server is going to respond very cutely mx.google.com at your service. So I haven't actually done anything there. I've just kind of let the server know, hey, look at me. I'm connected to you. So let's actually send an email using this interface here. So the first thing that I probably need to do in order to send an email is to log in. So I'm going to type in at this prompt, auth login. 
And so this isn't something that you know, I just had to figure out or made up. This is something that's specified by the SMTP protocol. According to this protocol, if I want to send an email as somebody, I need to log in. And the way I log in is by sending this message that just says the words off login. And I press Enter. And I get something that looks like this, 334 VXN, I can't pronounce that. And this is a really kind of, kind of strange. But what this is, is this is encoding and encoding of the word user. And what the SMTP server is actually doing is it's asking me for my username. But it's using this thing called base64 encoding. And all this is is just a way of encoding any type of data. So that could be binary data or just random things that aren't characters, just kind of turning them into ASCII readable characters. So this is, again, just something completely random um, that's specified by the SMTP protocol. Uh, but never fear, Google to the rescue. Uh, if I just Google convert to base64, we can just get this nice thing uh, that converts any text we want into base64. So you don't even have to worry too much about what base64 is. But if I want to convert the text Unicode love hotel at gmail.com and I click encode, this is simply the base64 encoding of Unicode love hotel at gmail.com. So if I paste this in, I get this, which is great. Anyone have a guess as to what this is encoding for? Yeah, exactly. This is just the base64 encoding of the word password. Uh, and so I'm going to do something super insecure and let you know what the password is, uh, which will be changed after this lecture, so don't get too crazy. Uh, but the password is just E1 Love Hotel. So if I click encode, this is now the encoding of E1 Love Hotel. So I'm going to copy this, come back here, paste it in. Whew, English again. So now I've just authenticated with the SMTP server. So now I've just logged in to the server. And so now that I'm logged in, I'm actually ready to send some messages. So just to recap what just happened, we're using base64 encoding just because SMTP told us to. I was prompted for a username. I supplied my username that was encoded. I was prompted for a password. So I, pro I provided a password that was encoded. And now I got this message saying, you've been accepted. So I'm logged in, and now I'm ready to actually send an email address. So to do that, I'm going to start typing English words again, which is great. So the first message that I'm going to send to my SMTP server is a message that looks like this. I'm going to type in and send this to my SMTP server. I want to say, mail from Unicode Love Hotel at gmail.com. And so you notice here I just have uh, the less than sign, the greater than sign separating, uh, kind of demarcating my email. So I type in mail from and I hit enter. I get, all right, OK, and some other stuff I don't really care about. So now that I specified where the mail is coming from, I now need to specify a recipient. So this RCPT is just something that SMTP says. If you want to tell me who to send the email to, type this in. So I will do that. I'm going to say RCPT2 tmacwilliam at live.com. This is the opposite of the best way to contact me because I didn't know this email existed until yesterday. So I click an enter and I get another OK, followed by some stuff I don't care about. So finally, I want to actually type in my email. So now if I type the word data and hit enter, this is again a step specified by the SMTP protocol that says if you type in the word data, it's going to say go ahead and type your email. So remember, my email is is, has two parts to it. So it first has the headers, and then it has the actual content of the message. So let's type some headers first. So this is going to be from the Unicode Love Hotel at gmail.com. It's going to tmacwilliam at live.com. The subject is cats, and the body is I like them. So now if I hit enter, and I have one more line that just has a dot on it, this is the way of telling SMTP I'm all done with my message. And I hit Enter. I got this thing here. I got another OK. So what just happened is I just sent an email. So I manually typed in all of the steps to sending an email uh, via SMTP. And if I jump back to my email address, my inbox here, we have an email there. And if this refreshes, oh, sorry, we're at the other one. So I sent to uh, my live.com. We can now see that I just got this email from Unicode Love Hotel. And I didn't log into Gmail and press send or anything. I just did this completely by manually interacting with the SMTP server. And this is exactly the, the content that I typed. 
Notice here that I didn't type in any HTML. So Outlook is kind of formatting this as plain text without any fonts or anything like that. And again, if I come up here to Actions and something like View Message Source, I can see that these are exactly the headers that I typed in originally, and this is the body of my message. And so this is what Gmail or Outlook.com is actually doing when you send an email. These are the messages that it's actually exchanging with the SMTP server, and then this is how the SMTP server is kind of forwarding along your email to another address. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so if we already said uh, mail from and receipt to, why do we have to do that again? That's a great point. And this is just something that, the reason being, just because SMTP tells us to. So this mail from is kind of a command that tells SMTP, hey, I'm going to create a new email message, and here's who it's coming from. But separately, we also want to encode that in a header just so that the person receiving it also has that information. For some reason, SMTP just doesn't kind of add the headers in itself. You have to manually add them. So in the same spirit, when we actually did the Telnet example, we said telnetgoogle.com, and then we had to say separately host, www.google.com. So it's kind of the same thing. Even though we're connected to an SMTP server, um, the SMTP server isn't going to take it upon itself to add in the headers. We kind of have to do that ourselves. OK, just to recap, we said data, then we typed our message. So that is how uh, we can send a message. So now let's take a look at a couple protocols for actually reading the messages. We'll go through this kind of quick, because uh, it's going to get kind of boring to just look at a bunch of protocols over and over again. Um, but this first one here is called POP3, uh, which stands for the Post Office Protocol. And this is the third version of it. And this is just, again, some sequence of commands I can send back and forth to interact and read messages on a web, on a web server. So again, this is not sending email. This is now for reading email. And again, it's going to be a similar process, just different commands. So to log in now, I don't have this base64 crap anymore. I can just say user, username, pass, and a password. And the pop server says, woohoo, you're welcome. So just to, so just to show you what that would look like, uh, rather than connecting to an SMTP server, if I instead connect to, for example, pop.gmail.com, and I hit Enter, and I can say something like user unicode love hotel at gmail.com. And this interaction is going to happen in exactly the same way. I'm going to make a connection to a server and just send some messages to it. So after I log in, if I type in this command list, it's going to send me back all of the emails in my inbox. It's going to give each one a unique number and tell me how big it is. So if I want to read the first one in my inbox, the command I would send would look like this, this RETR -R for retrieve. And this once I hit enter on retrieve one, it would actually download the email. So similarly, if I want to delete it, um, I would use deli1. So that's one way for reading email. And the details aren't all that interesting anymore, because it's just a different protocol. But another protocol you might have heard of is this thing called IMAP. So does anyone happen to know of any differences between POP and IMAP? Maybe you've kind of run into them as you've configured your iPhone and been frustrated with one. So POP is, is uh, one directional. So as we saw with the commands for pop, we said, I want to download a message. And the server is just going to send me that message. But what the server is not going to remember is that, OK, Tommy read this message. When he logs into gmail.com later, I better remember that the message is read. And this is something that IMAP actually will do. So when you set up an account on your iPhone and you read an email, then you go to your computer and you log into gmail.com, the kind of right thing to do is for gmail.com to know that you read that email. If I were using pop, that actually wouldn't be the case. With IMAP, on the other hand, it's, it is going to go ahead and remember that I read that email. So this is kind of bi-directional. I can download emails, and I can also send some information to the server about which ones I've read. So usually, if you're configuring an email address on your iPhone or Android phone, uh, using IMAP is going to be the default. So again, IMAP is just a protocol, just like POP, and it's just going to look a little bit different. So in order to log in using IMAP, I'm now going to say login with my username, and then I'm just going to specify the password on the same line. And the response I get back is going to look a little bit different. It's going to say OK, and then my name authenticated. So again, I can do kind of the same thing I did before. If I want to look at how many messages are in my inbox, rather than typing list, which is something POP does, I'm going to type in select inbox, and it's just going to give me some stats about my inbox. So IMAP is also a little bit more powerful than POP. 
Um, so for example, IMAP allows you to search your inbox for messages. So there's another advantage uh, of IMAP over POP. So for example, on Gmail, on the left-hand side, you see these various labels, like sent mail. You can also create your own mail, like work or personal. Um, so IMAP also has the ability to kind of work with these labels. So if, for example, I want to read everything that's inside of a label, I would say select and then the name of this label. Um, so Gmail sent mail label uh, is called this thing here, just Gmail slash sent mail. Now this would just, using IMAP, would tell me how many emails uh, I've sent. So finally, to actually download the message, in POP, we said something like uh, RETR1, or retrieve one. In IMAP, if you want the email headers, we'd say fetch one, and then I'd say I want just the header. Or if you want the actual email content, I would say fetch the first email in my inbox, but get the text, not just the headers. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so did POP predate IMAP? I believe it did. So POP3 is kind of the, a newer version of POP, but I want to say that the original version of POP was around before IMAP. And so that's why we're kind of missing this functionality. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. So let's, let's come back to this, this net neutrality thing we were looking at before. So we saw that in order to, to read some email um, using POP, I needed to connect to that server. So by the way, if I wanted to connect to an IMAP server, I would do the same thing. I need to make a connection to this imap.gmail.com. So if, however, my ISP said, well, you didn't pay for Gmail, so you don't get it, this would actually not be able to connect. Because the ISP would say, OK, I'm looking at some, some connection going through, and it's to something that you're not paying for. So this connection, I wouldn't get this prompt here. I would just get something that kind of hangs, because the connection was never made. And so yeah, so this exactly, this would not work. I would not be able to actually make a connection to gmail.com in order to read the messages that were sent to it. So, th so if someone else paid for the service, they could send emails to Gmail. But if I can't access the POP server or the IMAP server, I have no way of reading them. They're just kind of going to be sitting on one of Google's servers forever without me being able to access them. And so that, uh, by the way, is just the, the real only distinction uh, between uh, IMAP and POP and then SMTP. SMTP is just a protocol for interacting with the server to send email, uh, and POP and IMAP are a way of interacting with the server to receive email. So by the way, when I typed in those headers, as, as we alluded to before, I always I typed in, you know, I typed in mail from, my address, and then I said from my address. There's actually nothing preventing me from typing whatever I want in that header that says from. And so if we jump back over here, I actually have a small program here that will do just that. So this is going to set some email headers. I'm going to be sending a meeting to unicodelovehotel at gmail.com, but I'm saying it's from barack at whitehouse.gov. So obviously, I do not have access to the email account barack at whitehouse.gov. But there's nothing preventing me from creating an email with a header that says from Barack at whitehouse.gov. So if I actually send this email, and this is just being sent from some other server that happens to be able to send emails. So this has its own SMTP server. If I jump back uh, to Unicode Love Hotel, where I'm sure we have lots of really funny email addresses, if I come down here to spam, I actually have an email from Barack at whitehouse.gov who is asking me to meet, which you know, this actually happens, but this one just happened to be fake. And so this attack is called phishing. Someone has created this really, well, not in this case, but someone could create a really convincing looking spam message. They could even say it's from whitehouse.gov, even though they don't have access to the whitehouse.gov email account. And so if I reply to this email address, you know, I'm going to end up replying uh, to Barack at whitehouse.gov, uh, which isn't really helpful because I can't access that inbox. But instead, if this were like Barack at whitehouse.com, and me as a user, I didn't notice that the gov changed to a .com. And I'm some attacker, and I own whitehouse.com, because I can do that. Anyone can buy anything.com, assuming it's not taken. So now I could respond back with like my social security number or some other you know, important information that I shouldn't be sharing, and I just got hacked or fished. Someone was fishing for some information by kind of creating this fake look, this real looking, but fake email, because there's nothing preventing me from creating whatever email headers I want. And so that's where that term phishing comes from. Yeah? Is that what happened a couple of weeks ago when um, a group sent um, McConnell an email saying that um, prisoners at Guantanamo Bay were getting that student benefits? Was that the same type of thing? And they responded. 
responded, and his office responded to it and said, hey, that's not right, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, so, so, unfortunately, so I'm not actually familiar with the, the actual event you mentioned, but it could be the same thing. This, it's probably something that happened. Um, attacks like this could happen all the time. Uh, somewhat recently, uh, on the Harvard campus, uh, this actually happened. An address was sent out from like IT at harvard.edu, and it was like, hey, uh, something went wrong with your email, please send us your password and we'll fix your account. And so it wasn't actually sent from IT at harvard.edu, it was sent from some other address that was kind of masquerading as a Harvard address. So when I clicked reply, uh, which I didn't, but I'm sure some people did, that actually replied and sent their email to an address that was owned by some attacker. So someone just farmed a whole bunch of Harvard email addresses. And so that's how one way uh, for this phishing attack to actually go through. And yeah, so this, this probably happens in the news all the time because you know, people look at something and they say, hey, it's, it's from somebody. They, they, must be, that mu they must be who they say they are, um, but not necessarily. Question? Does it always go to the spam? Yeah, so does it always go to the spam? And so this could be something um, that Gmail has just gotten really good at. So you can see here, like, why is this message in spam? Uh, contains content that's typically used. And so Gmail could have actually looked at the headers and figured out like, hey, based on the address of this SMTP server, this is not an address from which at whitehouse.gov emails usually come. So Gmail can be smart and say, hey, I don't want to show you this because it's probably spam. So in this case, because this was kind of a, a badly orchestrated attack, it ended up in my spam. But more convincing ones uh, might get through Google's spam filter. So Google has people hard at work every day trying to make sure that their spam filter not only catches all of these attacks, but also doesn't catch something that's not an attack, which you may have happened before if something ended up in your spam folder that wasn't actually spam. So to answer your question, so uh, hopefully this does get caught by Google, um, but there's no guarantee that it always will. All right, so that's our, that's our fun. OK, so let's jump back and talk about uh, one more set of protocols uh, before we finish up. So I mentioned before that this HTTP, SMTP, all these things are kind of at a higher level, right? Last week we talked about sending information through a network, and now uh, we just finished up talking about what all that information looks like. So now let's take a look at what, an H what information is actually sent inside of a request. So what does an HTTP request look like kind of under the hood, right? How is that information actually sent through the network, right? Because when we typed in that HTTP address, we didn't mention anything about IP addresses. We didn't mention anything about source ports and destination ports and some of the other things that we looked at last week. So let's now look at, uh, at TCP and IP, which are the two protocols that are going to be used to actually send information through a network. Uh, so this first one here, uh, TCP stands for a transmission control protocol. And this is basically a protocol that's going to establish a connection between two machines. And this is how information will be sent from machine one to machine two. And so the way TCP works is it's connection oriented, which means that the first thing it does is it establishes a connection between point A and point B. And only once, excuse me, only once it knows that it has a connection will it start sending information back and forth. So one of the main goals, uh, our first, uh, this is basically what a TCP segment looks like. So when I make a big HTTP request, it's actually going to be divided up into these smaller TCP segments. So each of these TCP segments, which is kind of hard to read, um, but the slides are online, we have things like a source port and a destination port that contain some information about where this request is going. And now, down here at the bottom, we have something called data. And this is where that you know, get slash HTTP slash 1.1, that's where this is actually going to go. And so this segment is kind of like a unit of information that's going to be flowing through a network. So one of the main goals of TCP is to allow for reliable data transfer. So if we go to uh, a website, and it's going to send back a long HTTP response, as we said, that's going to get broken up into these smaller TCP segments that are then kind of sent through the network. If one of those segments is missing, that means that the web page that I'm looking at could be like randomly missing some text. Or maybe these things are delivered out of order. And so suddenly, you know, the, the text in the web page that I'm looking at is just kind of all jumbled and out of order and I can't read it. So what TCP ensures is that not only are all of the segments, or is it guaranteed that all of the segments from point A reach point B, we're guaranteeing that they arrive there in order. So that means we can have a large HTTP response from a server, get broken up into many small pieces. Each of those small pieces gets sent individually through the network. And then at the client, 
we're going to kind of reconstruct those to get the original response. So the way that we're going to make sure that everything gets delivered in the same order are with these things called sequence numbers. So if I have this HTTP request or some other request going through a network, and I break it up into, say, two TCP segments, I'm going to number each of those segments. So the first 500 bytes would go in segment 0, for example, and the second 500 bytes can go in a segment uh, numbered like 500 or numbered 1 or 2. So basically now, once we have all of the segments, we can order them using these sequence numbers to kind of reconstruct our original message. So now that's the problem of, solving to, of kind of getting all of the segments in order. So we also have the problem of making sure all of the segments get there in the first place. And so to do that, TCP sends this other thing called an ACK, or an acknowledgment. So every time I send a segment from point A to point B, point B is actually going to respond, hey, I got that segment, just so you know. So now the client knows, OK, my segment definitely got delivered to the server because it sent me back a response that confirmed the receipt. So kind of like when you send an email, you can have like an email receipt attached to it that lets you know when someone read it, or similarly with, with your iPhone and iMessage. We have the same concept here. The server knows when another server has actually read its message. And so this uh, is what communication between two hosts using TCP could look like. So we're sending here two segments. So on the left, we have the sender, and on the right, we have the receiver. So it means we sent a segment uh, from point A to point B, and then a receiver responded by sending back an acknowledgment. So now the, per the computer on the left knows that the other computer received that segment. And so now we'll send another one, and the receiver will respond with an acknowledgment, yep, I got that segment. And so now we know that these segments were transferred reliably because the other person acknowledged that they received them. So let's go back to this idea of sequence numbers, because that was just kind of acknowledging which segments have arrived. But we need to make sure that we keep track of which segments have arrived so we make sure we get them all. So the first step uh, in a TCP connection process is going to be this thing called the handshake. And the handshake is what's going to actually establish a connection between two computers. So the handshake process looks something like this. So I'm going to spend, send a special segment with this flag here, SYN. SYN. It's going to have a special flag set that says, this is the first segment I'm sending to you. So I'm going to establish a connection. And I'm just going to pick a sequence number totally at random. So I'm going to say, this has sequence number 42. And it doesn't matter. I just picked a random one um, since it's the first request. And so now the other computer I'm communicating with is going to respond uh, with a similar segment that says, OK, I got your first request. And now we have two computers that are ready to talk to each other. So we mentioned before that we want to make sure that all of these segments get delivered. And last week, we took a, little, a look at IP, or the internet protocol that kind of describes how a packet goes from one router to another router. And it turns out that there's actually no guarantee that a, one of these requests is going to make it all the way to its destination. Right? That's just something the internet doesn't guarantee for us. Instead, we use something called best effort delivery. And that basically says, the internet says, I'm going to try my best to make sure that your request reaches CNN.com. But if it doesn't, eh, you better figure it out. And so TCP needs to figure out a way of dealing with the fact that some of the segments that it sends will actually not reach their destination. So the way it's going to do that is with these sequence numbers and acknowledgments. So let's say that I'm sending this request. I've already established a handshake, so I just have, I have the sequence number. and It doesn't even matter what it is. So I send a segment. Let's say that it's 8 bytes large each of these TCP segments has to have some fixed size. So it's 8 bytes. So I send a segment to client 2. And attached to it is the sequence number 42. So when the client responds to me, it's going to send back an acknowledgment. What it's also going to send back is some number that represents basically how many bytes it has received so far. So we started at sequence number 42. My, my segment was 8 bytes long. So it's going to send back the number 50, because that's 42 plus 8. So we know that the next uh, segment that I should send should have a sequence number that starts at 50, right? because I've sent the first 8 bytes. It's now time to send some other segment. And if this one could be a different size, like 16 bytes, then the acknowledgment sent back is going to be 50 plus 16, because the other client's going to say, OK, I've received 66 of your bytes. Make sense? 
OK, so let's just see quickly how we can use that to recover from errors. So some of these segments might not reach their destination. So let's say that my client sends a segment. It has a sequence number of 42. And it gets lost in the abyss of the internet. So then that means that no acknowledgment is going to be sent. So the client's going to say, hey, I sent this segment that's number 42, but I never got an acknowledgment back. So that means that I probably need to send it again, because I have no, I, I have no confirmation that it was actually received. So I'm going to try again. And now let's say that when it tries again, it actually gets through. So that means that the other, uh, the other computer here will send an acknowledgment, just like we saw, that is simply 42 plus the 8 bytes of the segment, so it has a 50. It says, I've received 50 of your bytes. So that's if the segment gets lost, but there's actually a probability that the acknowledgment will get lost. Right? There's, there's, no, there's nothing that says an acknowledgment will definitely be delivered, but a segment won't. So really, any of these arrows could end up getting lost in the abyss of the internet. So if that happens, if that acknowledgment gets lost, we kind of have the same exact situation. So let's say I sent a segment from the left to the right, and it got delivered, and the right has it, and the right responds with an acknowledgment, that gets lost. So that means, again, this computer on the left does not know whether or not the computer on the right actually received the message. So unfortunately, it's going to send it again. So even though the computer on the right already has that information, we still need to send it again because we don't know whether or not that computer actually got it. Right? My segment could have been lost or the acknowledgment could have been lost, but I can't guarantee that it was delivered until I receive an acknowledgment from every single segment that I send from point A to point B. Questions? OK, so last week, or a couple weeks ago rather, we looked at this thing called parallelism. And we said basically that in a computer, it might be more efficient sometimes to do several things at the same time. Oh, question first? Yeah, so could, so could this end up uh, sending an email that says the same thing? So that was probably more the case that you know, the SMTP server kind of messed up. And the SMTP server maybe thought that the email uh, wasn't delivered when it actually was. But yeah, underlying that problem is kind of the same thing, when a client thinks something wasn't delivered, but it actually was. So yeah, so that could be um, one of the underlying causes of that happening at kind of a higher level. Because usually a, a big, long email is probably going to be divided up into multiple segments. And TCP does its best to make sure that all of those segments are actually delivered. So yeah, so that, that could be one reason underlying something like that. So now, let's say that we send multiple things at the same time. So now we don't have to wait for a request to get all the way back before we send the next segment. So let's try, for example, sending two at once. So if we send two segments at once, we're expecting two acknowledgments, you know, one for the first segment and one for the second segment. But we have a bunch of different things that could happen. Right? The second one could arrive before the first one. The first one could arrive before the second one. The second one never arrives at all, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we need to actually start using this system of sequence numbers and acknowledgments to kind of deal with that problem. And so here's just one uh, kind of scenario that could happen. So let's walk through this. So hypothetically, we're sending two segments. The first has a sequence number of 42. The second one has a sequence number of 50. So the first one gets sent, and it never actually makes it to the destination. But we're doing multiple things at once, so we're also going to send at the same time another TCP segment. So we've kind of sent two, and now we're waiting for acknowledgments from either one. So let's say um, that the third step of this process here is that the computer on the right receives the segment with the sequence number 50. So this was the second se segment that was sent. So this, the computer on the right is going to say, hey, you just sent me a segment with number 50. That's a problem because I was waiting for the segment with the sequence number 42. Because remember in that handshake process, we kind of established what sequence, you know, both computers got on the same page as to what sequence number they were on. So if the computer on the right is waiting for 42, but it receives 50, it's going to say, hey, 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 stop. You need to send me 42 before you do anything. So we're going to acknowledge the acknowledgment we send back is not going to be 50, or it's not going to be 66. It's going to say 42. And this is the way that the computer on the right can say to our sender, hey, you need to send me packet 42, or segment 42, before you do anything else. So now, uh, my computer on the left is going to get 
this acknowledgement here that says 42, it's going to realize, oh, that must mean that my first packet is the one that wasn't delivered. So what I need to do then is after waiting a while, maybe for that other acknowledgement, is to resend the packet uh, segment numbered 42. So then, once my computer gets, the other computer here gets segment 42, well, it already received 50. And so for it to tell the computer on the left to resend 50 would be kind of a waste of time. So because it's already received 50, and now it got the one it was waiting for, the kind of missing puzzle piece, it's going to respond with the number of 66. Because it's received, so far, 66 bytes of the segment. Right? It received 42, and then it got 50, so now the next one that it's expecting to receive is 66. So for the computer on the left, this is just kind of a pleasant surprise. Right? It had no idea what happened, to the first, what happened to the second packet. It just knows that, oh, the first one didn't go through. I need to stop and try again. And so now when it got back, this other 66, we kind of realized, oh, nice. My second one actually got there in the first place. So I don't need to, re, uh, I don't need to bother resending it. I can just kind of keep going. So questions on TCP? It's going to be a little bit confusing to what these numbers actually mean. Yeah. Yeah, so in the handshake, so how do we know uh, what numbers to use? So in the handshake, both of these computers kind of got on the same page. They said, we need to start with 42. So that means that the computer on the right was expecting a 42. So when it didn't get a 42, it got a number larger, it's going to say, hey, why did you do that? I'm still waiting on 42, because we need to make sure these are delivered in the same order. So then it's going to send back an acknowledgment that tells the computer on the left, hey, I'm looking for 42. I don't know what the heck you just did, but you need to send me segment 42. So because they both got on the same page during the handshake, the right was expecting sequence 42, and it didn't get it. So what would it have sent if it had gotten sequence Yeah, so, let, so let's say uh, that we got 42. Then it would have sent an acknowledgment saying, OK, if that was 8 bytes, I'm now expecting 50. Then if it got 50, it would say, OK, well, now that was 16 bytes, and now I'm accept, uh, expecting 66. So even if we do this in parallel, it could end up sending two acknowledgments. Or it could be the case uh, that, the, that these, are, these both arrive out of order, in which case we'll send the 42, but then we'll also send the 66 right away, because they both arrived just out of order. And because the client was kind of waiting a while before it retried, then it won't actually waste its time kind of resending unnecessary information. Yeah. In, so in what sense? Yeah, so exactly. So in that sense, an acknowledgment could say, I did get it or I didn't get it. So really what the acknowledgment says is that number inside of the acknowledgment is saying, what do I want next? So it's telling the computer on the left which segment number they should send next. And so here we're saying we want 42 next, or we're saying we want 66 next. And the client on the left can figure out what happened based on the numbers it's sent and the numbers it's received back. Other questions? OK. So there's more information about IP in the recaps. Um, so feel free to read that. Um, but rather than talking about IP, let's talk about something more fun. So has anyone ever seen this word in the internet anywhere? Memes? So what is a meme? You know. Sure. So, so can anyone kind of describe or give an example of a meme, for example? Yeah. Yeah. So a meme is, is generally some, some picture that someone's taken. And then we start kind of captioning it with these different things. And so on the internet, you might see these things called advice animals, with like example, uh, animals making like funny faces, and then there's a joke associated with them. Um, but memes are actually a really interesting example of internet culture and kind of what happens when you create this big thing uh, called the internet and suddenly all these different computers are connected and they're to we have totally unrestricted access to the internet. I can contact any other computer on the internet and I can interact with really anyone on the world. And there's no really governance of the internet, right? There's no like president of the internet who makes some rules of the internet that say you know, what I can and cannot do. 
And so this kind of lack of control in the internet has resulted in this kind of community that, that can generate new content, right? So a really good example of a meme uh, is this picture here. Does anyone recognize this? Yeah, so this is the Olympics. So this is Michaela Maroney, uh, who is on the US uh, women's gymnastic team. And she was kind of favored to win the gold medal. And then she goes up and does her vault and falls, uh, not in her face, in the other direction. Uh, and she's really disappointed. And so this picture was taken uh, of her on the podium with a silver medal around her neck. And a silver medal in the Olympics is, is still pretty impressive. Um, but this meme, kinda, it kind of caught fire on the internet. Everyone kind of got a hold of this picture. And, you know, it just thought it was this absolutely great thing. And this has kind of emerged as this viral phenomenon. And really, only with the connectedness of the internet could this kind of emerge with this virality. Right? It, it went so far as to result in pictures like this, uh, which actually recently happened uh, when the gymnastics team visited the White House. And so this is the kind of culture that emerges on this totally open community where anyone can communicate with anybody else. So we just took this event in history that happened in, in a photo that kind of captured the total essence of this event. And suddenly, when everyone can start talking about that event and exchanging information back and forth at a really rapid pace, then that's when things can kind of go viral. And suddenly, everyone can start talking about it, and, and it starts being important to everyone. The, so another example is this guy here. <laughs> Anyone recognize my all-time favorite meme ever? Grumpy. Yeah, so this is Grumpy Cat. And so uh, again, this is just a picture uh, that someone took on the internet of a cat that looks e exceedingly grumpy. And you know, in the every, every day, this isn't a big deal, right? Just someone's cat just looks kind of in a bad mood. But suddenly, once you put this on the internet and you have all of these people with access to it, that where you can talk about it really, really quickly with one another, suddenly this just becomes a cultural phenomenon. And without the internet connecting everything together, we just wouldn't have these phenomenons. So suddenly, we get images that take this, this really mundane moment in history that is really is not affecting anyone's life, and suddenly have hundreds of images like these uh, around the internet. Uh, so at, in Christmas time, uh, Grumpy Cat doesn't like that either. So we have other images like this that just kind of emerge as a result of one person taking one photo and putting it on the internet one time. With, only with this kind of connectedness can we really start to create this virality and, and really cool interactions um, because we're so connected. And so kind of moving forward, you know, the world is becoming even more and more connected. Not only more connected, but these connections are becoming faster. And so it's going to be really interesting to see kind of the culture that emerges as a result of this completely loose system. You know, there, there's, no, there's no internet overlords. You know, you're, we've seen the internet is so loosely coupled. We just have routers connecting things everywhere, and suddenly we just have this huge network of stuff. And so it's going to be really interesting moving forward, you know, as the internet kind of matures and develops further, kind of what results from creating something like the internet, something crazily connected where I can do things like post a picture of a grumpy cat and have hundreds of thousands of people looking at it and generating their own grumpy cats. So that's just kind of a, a fun note to end on. Um, so uh, by the way, this, there's a, cool, a really cool YouTube video uh, called Warriors of the Net, uh, which is basically, th th it looks like a movie trailer. And it's kind of like for some CGI movie. And uh, what it actually is, is a really great explanation of how a segment or a packet travels through the entire internet going through uh, routers and switches and things like that. So if you have a moment, I definitely recommend watching this. It's like 10 minutes long, uh, but it's, it's a really cool uh, production that really kind of recaps everything that we've talked about uh, with the internet lately. Uh, and so that's it uh, for lecture four and the internet. Uh, so I'd encourage you to stick around for the review session. We really have lots of opportunities to ask uh, Ben and RJ questions about the exam and material that you found confusing. And if not, um, then we'll see you next week for the first exam, and good luck studying.